Good morning, everybody. It is a great pleasure to be back in Bern again. I have not been here for a long time, although every time I've been here, it has been because Matthias Stürmer has invited me. Uh, it's all your fault. Um, okay, good morning. Um, my name's Simon Phipps, as you have just heard. Uh, at the moment, I am the president of the Open Source Initiative, as you can tell. Um, I've been in the computer industry for a long time. I, I started the Java business uh, with a few other people at IBM in the 1990s. And I uh, then went on to open source Java at Sun in the following decade, which was very exciting. And since um, the, uh, the demise of Sun, I've been working in the, uh, the uh, private uh, charity sector on a load of boards. Now, I'm here to talk to you about the history of open source and what's going to happen next with open source as a movement. And you'll see my title here is 15 plus 20, what's next? So that 15 relates to, oh, and that wasn't good. <laughs> Let's try that again, shall we? There we go. The origins of open source. Now, open source has been around as a, as a phrase for 20 years applied to software, but the, the concept that it covers has been around a lot longer. Uh, that's been around another 15 years back. Uh, at the beginning of the 1980s, there were already people who were worrying about your ability to get hold of the source code to the software that you work with. And so uh, in the late 1970s, from about 1978 onwards, a gentleman called Bill Joy, working on the west coast of the US at Berkeley University, began building a, a, a set of tools to use with AT&T Unix. And that set of tools gradually got larger and larger and larger. And gradually, because of the proprietary attitude of AT&T towards Unix, that group of people started rewriting more and more of Unix. And by the mid-1980s, they had a complete substitute for Unix called BSD Unix. And Bill was the, the author of BSD Unix. Uh, and by the end of the 1980s, there was a well-known license that had been written that allowed BSD Unix to be used by, used by anybody, but much more importantly, for the full source code to be available to anyone that needed it. Now, at the same time that was happening, over on the US East Coast, this other gentleman, uh, Richard Stallman, was working at MIT. And uh, they had a new printer delivered, and that printer didn't work properly. And Richard decided he would go fix it the way he had always gone and fixed it, by getting the source code to the printer driver and making it work for his system. Only he found he couldn't, because the vendor had not supplied the source code to the printer driver. And that was the beginning of Richard's lifelong campaign to make sure that we all have the freedom to have the software that we want in our lives. Because Richard, right at the beginning, understood that uh, it's actually the code that is the law. It was um, uh, another author that coined the phrase, code is law. But Richard really understood that if you're not in control of the computer that's in front of you, then somebody else is in control of the computer that's in front of you. And over time, they will be in control of you. And so Richard, right back then in the 1980s, started a campaign to make sure that we have the freedom to get hold of the software that controls our lives. Uh, Richard, and it went on to be written down in the FSF's uh, definition of free software, he wrote that free software is software that gives you, the user, your freedom. And so the, the movement that uh, uh, rep is represented as free software uh, started out as an ethical system, a personal ethical system, with a priority to give people control over their lives. Now, back in the 1980s, if you wanted the source code to BSD Unix, or if you wanted the source code to uh, uh, any other piece of uh, free software, you will probably have had to have sent a magnetic tape to somebody. 
Indeed, the big argument with uh, James Gosling and Richard Stallman over Emacs was all about, in fact, who was going to send tapes out with Emacs on to the people who requested them. And that's another story that I'll tell you later if you'd like to hear it. But uh, out of that argument sprang the GNU General Public License. And that license existed before most people had access to anything you would call the Internet. When the Internet finally became endemic, when, when everybody had connection to everybody else, the idea behind free software became much more powerful because now it was actually possible for you to get the source code yourself in your home on demand. And the power of that as a tool to give people their freedom and particularly to give software developers the freedom to collaborate with each other began to become obvious at the end of the 1990s. Only we found um, that uh, you know, us poor English people, we, we only speak two languages. We speak English and rubbish. And uh, as you'll have heard from the Brexit discussion, it's mostly rubbish. Um, and uh, so when you say the word free to somebody who has English as a first language, they immediately think about money. They don't think about liberty. And so we found that in explaining free software to people, particularly business people, we were immediately having to explain things that shouldn't need explaining, even before we had started explaining things. Because we would say free software, and people would start thinking of money. It became obvious we needed to talk about it a different way. Uh, the freedoms are still the same freedoms that you fundamentally need the freedom to use software for any purpose, the freedom to study it and understand it, the freedom to improve it uh, to better meet your needs or the needs of people you care about, and the freedom to share it with anyone you wish, modified or unmodified. Those four freedoms are fundamental to the uh, existence of software, and when those four freedoms are not present, then somebody else controls you. But talking about it, we began to realize we needed some other words. And so at the end of the 1990s, <clears throat> a group of people got together in California and had a discussion about what to do about this. And they decided to start a marketing campaign for free software. And to have that marketing campaign have its own name different from free software so that business people would not get confused when you tried to explain it to them. And uh, Christine Peterson, who was not from the software world at all, suggested that the perfect name for free software when explained to business people was open source. And so that was the beginning of the open source movement. Fifteen years into the free software movement, a group of people started a marketing campaign for uh, free software called open source. And as they say, the rest is history. With uh, the right words to describe it, suddenly it was possible to explain it to people. It was possible to explain to people that if they used open source software, they could work with others. They could share other software. They could use other people's innovation. They could have their own innovation maintained by others. And suddenly, we were in a world that was going to change. Uh, by making that simple distinction between liberty and commerce, as we did with open source. And this is uh, the Doc Cranes of New Jersey doing their very best to adopt the posture of liberty. But we're never confused because we know that liberty and commerce are two different things, even if they have got a strong relationship. By making that distinction between liberty and commerce, we were able to start a, a revolution. Open source enabled software users and software developers to advance software freedom at work as well as in their private life. And that, that was the key. So let me run you through the first 20 years. I'm going to go through minute by minute. No. Um, the first 20 years. The first 10 years were full of advocacy and controversy. Uh, at the beginning of those 20 years, the Open Source Initiative was founded. It was founded by a, a, a diverse group of people, uh, including Eric Raymond and Bruce Perrins. Uh, Bruce is still helping us at OSI today. He is our, our chair of standards and open source, and he's helping us with our work on standards, essential patents, and open source, which is a current um, significant issue in the global wireless market. But OSI has been around since 1998, 
And uh, the main role we have had for those 20 years is as the steward of the open source definition. Um, the open source definition was published in 1999. Uh, so in 1999, Bruce was asked, you know, can you define open source? And he said, well, actually, it's the same as this document that I've been making, the Debian Free Software Guidelines. And so the open source definition started with the Debian Free Software Guidelines, which is why you'll find they are very similar even today. The first decade was a, a whirlwind of events. Uh, it, was, it was obvious that open source was relevant when in 2001 Microsoft decided to try and kill it by calling it cancer and by, as we discovered, having a, a documented uh, a corporate plan to uh, remove it from the world stage, uh, documented in something called the Halloween documents. Um, uh, we also saw opportunist lawyers jump in, as they tend to, uh, uh, going with an organization called the Santa Cruz Operation, trying to take down IBM's use of Linux. But that all began to fade by the middle of the decade. Uh, by the middle of the decade, Sun Microsystems, where I worked at the time, had made Unix open source at last, after all those years, by releasing Open Solaris. Uh, and by, in 2007, I had the privilege of making Java open source and wresting it out of the hands, as we, we, we have now discovered, of a future oracle. Um, so uh, that decade was full of interesting things, but it was characterized by open source going from revolutionary upstart idea to dominant thought in the minds of CIOs all over the world. By 2008, most CIOs understood that open source was a benefit to them. Uh, in actual fact, uh, in their departments, their developers found out before them. We used to regularly at Sun go and visit companies and ask the CIO whether they were using open source in their company. And they'd say no. And we'd say, so uh, what's running your website? And they'd say, oh, well, um, something called Apache. And we'd say, and uh, you, do you have any other open source then? And we would discover that the whole substrate of their company was open source. And they had never realized it. And so by 2008, they were beginning to wake up to that reality. So why did open source work? Why was it that it worked? There were, I think, three reasons that were true then and are true now. Uh, open source relies on not my choice as president of OSI about what open source means, but by what you mean by open source crystallized through OSI. Secondly, uh, open source is about a multilateral agreement to collaborate. And thirdly, open source is about safe spaces where we're protected from each other's business models. So let's talk about those. Crystallization of consensus. Now, the way that a new open source license <coughs> is approved as an open source license is not that I, I go and sit in my throne in the OSI throne room and put on my, 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 my coronet of power and rule on whether the license is open source. As many companies wish that was the way it was, because uh, I'm a consultant, you can pay me. I'm very happy to do things for you. Uh, but uh, that isn't the way that it works. The way that it works is that you as a company bring your license to OSI's public mailing list called License Review, and then everyone in the world can comment freely on what you have just done. Imagine a parliamentary debate that was run on Reddit, and that's very much like what the process is. It's a little bit more polite, but not a lot. MongoDB is at the moment going through that process. They wrote a very, uh, a very challenging new license uh, called the server-side public license, which they have sent into license review for review now. And we're just beginning to see the really serious comments coming in on the mailing list. And they're coming in from lawyers all over the world. They're coming in from developers all over the world. And what's going to happen is that conversation is going to, it's going to warm up. I guarantee you it's going to get, become a much hotter conversation very soon. And there will be a discussion between the participants. And if they're smart, MongoDB, who are my, they're my clients, so I've told them they should be smart, uh, MongoDB will take all of that feedback and they will produce another version of the license and present that to the mailing list. And what will happen is people will discuss and iterate, discuss and iterate, and eventually there will be consensus about the license. 
Hopefully, it will be consensus that it really is an open source license that meets the open source definition. But there might be consensus that it's not a, a qualifying open source license. Whatever happens, when the consensus is reached and the conversation dies down, OSI will then step in and crystallize that consensus. We are like the finalizer in the routine to create new licenses. At the end of that process, we will say, well, everyone discussed, and they said this and this and this, and the license meets these criteria, and the OSI board says, yes, we agree, that is an open source license, or no, we disagree, that's not an open source license. In that process, we're not king. We are not a Trump-like president. We are the Speaker of the House. We are simply at the head of the conversation, having to lead what happens, crystallize it, and then finalize it. And so that is the process that OSI has followed for 20 years now. There's around about 80 licenses that have been approved that way. And the reason they have authority is that they have been agreed by us all. And having been agreed by us all, we all know that they have the attributes that give you the four freedoms and enable you to collaborate with others. And so, as a consequence, you don't have to ask. And that was the big problem before. The big problem before was you would always have to ask if you had the right to, in to innovate. Open source lets you innovate without having to ask first. Secondly, it's a bilateral agreement. Sorry, a multilateral agreement. That's me making a mess. If you ask a lawyer what a, a, a license is, a license is a bilateral agreement between two parties that sets the terms of the relationship between the two parties over some form of property. And uh, that bilateral characteristic is very important for most licensing situations. If you're given a license to use a piece of land, or if you're given a license to perform a piece of music, there is a, a very definite bilateral relationship between the two parties. But in the world of open source, it's not like that. Open source is a multilateral agreement. It is all of the parties in a community coming together and saying, in order to be a community, we need these rights. And so we therefore assert that when this software is licensed, everybody who receives it receives these rights. And those rights are the right to use, study, modify, and share the software. And because a license is the multilateral consensus of a community, that gives everybody the same rights. An open source community is a level playing field. It is a place where everybody should have the same rights. That's why uh, behaviors by vendors who decide to retain special rights for themselves are considered to be distasteful at best by the open source community. Because in an open source community, we have a multilateral consensus that we all have the same rights. That, that's what an open source license is. It's a, a multilateral consensus of the permissions and norms of a community. And then creating safe spaces. And that again has got three bullets, which I'll dive straight into for you. First of all, um, open source involves a lot of different people coming together. And each of those people, when they come together, brings with them their intrinsic motivation. Their intrinsic motivation in many cases is that they are employed by a business that wants to make money from the software. And there will be some business model associated with that engagement. And in order to make money in business, you need a control point. You need something that is scarce. You know, there is only one business model. That is, I share with you what is abundant to me in return for what is abundant to you. So if I have abundant book writing skills and I write abundant books, I can sell you my book and you can give me your abundant money in exchange. Uh, business models depend on a scarcity gradient that is satisfied by the conduct of the business. And so you need control points. And so uh, there are lots of control points around. Whoops, let's go back. Um, there are copyrights, there are uh, trademarks, there are patents. Those are the three main ones that get involved in software. And it's very important if you're going to have an equal community on a level playing field that no one owns a control point that they can use to gain leverage over the other participants in the community. 
And so open source licenses mitigate the ownership of those control points. They give you a free license to the copyright. They exclude the trademarks from the scope of the work. They, in most cases, give you a license to any necessary patents. And that means that when you come into the community, you know that there are no control points that are going to take away your freedom to make money, which is what motivated you to join in the first place. I hear a lot of discussion about open source business models. Um, open source business models, they were, the, they were what everyone talked about at the beginning of the decade in the, in the, 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 the 2000s. And uh, I have to tell you, there is no such thing as an open source business model because open source uh, businesses are the things that have business models. Open source communities don't. Open source communities have code and collaboration, and the participants in the communities have business models. And if we're going to be able to collaborate with each other, you need to be protected from my business model. You, we need to make sure that when we are collaborating together, you're never sitting there just waiting for me to ask you for money because you'll hold back on your contributions, if that's what is the case. And so when we're considering licenses at OSI, we don't make exceptions to support people's business models, because ultimately, your business model is your problem. If you need your business model implemented in the license to make it viable, then I'm sorry, you have the wrong business model. And we will not be approving a license that supports you. We're here to remove obstacles. We're here to help people go places that they wouldn't otherwise be able to go. And the open source won in the first decade because, well, we tried reuse. I did reuse at IBM in 1990. No one wants to reuse other people's software, trust me. But reuse is better than re-implementing code. But it turns out that collaborative development is better than reuse. And it turns out that both are chilled when you have to ask permission, either to use the code or to contribute your improvement back. And software freedom solves that problem. Software freedom creates a world in which reuse is not only possible, but preferable. And OSI made that software freedom world possible by standardizing licenses. And that, as a consequence, is the reason why by the 19... Uh, uh, by 2008, open source was already a dominant thought. Which leads us to the second decade. Don't worry, this is faster. Um, so what happened in the second decade? Well, there was a, a whirlwind of adoption and, and, and activity. Um, I gave you uh, the first 10 years in summary. By 2015, Microsoft had decided not to kill open source. Uh, because, well, actually, open source had kind of killed them. Um, <laughs> And they decided they would start a new business. I, 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 let me try and explain what's happening at Microsoft to you. What's happening at Microsoft is Microsoft has discovered the world has changed. And they've discovered that Windows and Office have a limited life. People will not be using them in seven years' time. And they've decided to start a new business. Uh, it's called Azure. And that new business is a platform-as-a-service business that they're going to be using to monetize historic assets and also to serve developers in a future world. And they're funding that startup with the legacy revenue from Windows and Office. And I have a lot of trust in their new business. It is staffed by people who believe in software freedom. It is engaged in a platform that has a both, a, a, it's both constructed from free software and it is also a platform which fundamentally depends on the cooperation of developers who believe in free software. So I, I believe that they're heading in the right direction. I worry about their legacy businesses because their legacy businesses do not have the message and may well engage in counterproductive behaviors. But generally, I believe them when they say Microsoft loves Linux as long as by Microsoft you mean Azure. Uh, but today, 2017, open source is at the heart of pretty much everything that's new. And uh, so we have discovered that the landscape is changing around software. We've discovered that the old rules no longer apply. And the new rules are rules that say that intellectual property is something you leverage to buy collaboration. It is not something you leverage to sell licenses. <clears throat> it's something you leverage to buy collaboration. We've discovered that open source has a set of real values that are important. It, it lets you innovate without needing to ask first. It lets you start where others have reached rather than having to re-implement. It lets you 
use the resources of others, and yet stay in control of your own resources. It lets you share in, you, in the upkeep of innovation that you create. So when you innovate, if you put that innovation into an open source community, other people will maintain it for you. Now that's actually really big. There's a, uh, when I was uh, working for Unisys in the 1980s, I wrote some COBOL code for a bank. And I spent the next decade fearing that that bank was going to ask me to come back and maintain my COBOL code. I used to keep the magnetic tape in the bottom drawer of the filing cabinet, just in case. I finally threw it away in, in uh, 2010, I think it was. So I, I kept it for, for, for 25 years to, uh, to do that. Th that's the fear you have with proprietary software, because if you invent it, well, you also maintain it. But when you're using open source, if you invent it, you commit it to the community, and then they look after it for you. It's like having servants to look after your cat. It's, it's wonderful. Somebody else clears out the kitty litter while you stroke it. When you're using open source, if you share into the community, others look after your innovation. You get to influence global ecosystems. Now, it's pretty common for people in Bern to be aware that you are influencing global events. But this is another way you can do it. You can work with software and influence the global market. And you can be protected from the other people who are doing the same thing, which is even better. Now, all of those things depend on software freedom. You don't get any of those things without the freedom to use software for any purpose, the freedom to study it, the freedom to improve it, and the freedom to share it. And so open source is an ethical system. It's just open source is an ethical system explained in terms of its pragmatic benefits. And we're the same movement as the free software movement, just explained differently. Uh, new technologies today are only possible because of open source. My point of proof? Cloud. How could you do cloud without open source? You would be constantly having to check you had a license. You would be sitting there with the, not letting the computer scale up to meet demand because you'd need to check that you have enough licenses of that Oracle proprietary software to be able to spawn a new instance. Your life would be a circle of licensing hell, constantly being audited by rent-seeking software corporations, trying to make sure that you have paid your money in order to run your cloud. It just wouldn't work. And IoT. Smart devices. You know what the S in smart stands for? It stands for security risk. Uh, a smart device is a device you've introduced into your home that you can never make safe, just in case you didn't know. But anyway, IoT. IoT would not be possible without open source. IoT would uh, require you to constantly enumerate what's in every bit of the thing and count them so that some license holder somewhere could be paid the royalties on the software. Open source has enabled the IoT revolution. So what's coming? We've got a world that, after 20 years of open source, which has created a revolution that has popularized the 15-year-old free software movement, what's coming next? Well, one of the things that's coming next is OSI has changed. OSI has become a member organization. You can join personally if you want to. It's $40. Visit our website. Uh, you can also have your open source association join OSI. That's free of charge, but you have to be a, a recognized nonprofit to do that. But many nonprofit organizations around the world have joined OSI. So today you'll see that Linux Foundation and Mozilla and Wikimedia Foundation are all members of this big cluster of organizations that uh, use open source software or create open source software. And that gives strength to OSI when we speak out about issues as we're increasingly needing to do on the, the political stage. When we are talking about open source, we're able to talk about open source from the position of representing uh, well over 50 uh, open source organizations that themselves have shaped the world. And we're able to do so on the basis of individual members who are users or developers or just supporters of open source software. Um, but there are some trends coming, and I'm going to tell you what they are. There are five of them. Uh, first of all, I'm going to explain to you that the community is king. Whatever it is that you're doing, the error that you're making, if you're making an error, is that you've not taken the community into account. Secondly, I'm going to suggest to you that single project open source companies are not viable in the future. They're going to go away. Uh, thirdly, we're going to talk briefly about licensing. 
Uh, we're going to talk about software freedom some more and about new roles for OSI. And in the middle of all that, with luck, I'll give you a demo. So, community styles. If you remember the first decade of open source, you'll remember there was a strong dominant meme, which was, is this year going to be the year of Linux on the desktop? <coughs> Every year we have asked that question. Uh, but uh, uh, in the second decade of open source, people kind of tired of asking if it's the year of Linux on the desktop, and they started building solutions using open source paths. So the second decade was really the decade of assembling open source components into working solutions. But in the third decade, well, the cloud is the desktop, and the network is the computer, which I can now say because Sun doesn't own it as a trademark. The cloud is the desktop, and the network is the computer. Um, well, actually, you know, the year of the Linux desktop is already here. Uh, I don't know if you noticed it coming. Did you notice it coming? Um, because, you see, this is running Linux. And this has got a desktop that is running a whole load of apps that are running on top of Linux. We've had a Linux desktop for a long time. But more than that, when you use your web browser, well, that's a Linux desktop too. It's extremely likely that the server that is serving that page up to you is running the Linux operating system and is running a whole stack of software that is open source running on top of Linux. Our mistake in thinking about the year of the Linux desktop was to assume that it was going to be just the way Microsoft did it. But no, the world we've invented is a much better world that doesn't require you to have a hobby of looking after a computer. I've got enough hobbies. I don't need to you know, update my antivirus, wipe its bottom, and whatever it is. I, 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 I'm able to just use my computer. Now, this is hard for software freedom, because in the cloud, you don't necessarily see the software, and you don't necessarily have a way whereby you could take control if you needed to shout at it. And uh, so we need to do something about that. We need to code for user freedom. We need to think through what gives the user the freedom to break out of the box when they need to. And I, I'm also on the board of the Document Foundation that makes LibreOffice. That's what I'm running this presentation with, is LibreOffice. Uh, what's a little unusual here is I'm running this pr presentation in LibreOffice on a Chromebook. This is, this is not a, a normal PC, this is a Chromebook. And if I break out of that Chromebook and come over here, you will see that I also have the same slides in Google Docs. I'm able to do that because Google Docs is able to open and display files that are in open document format, which is the international standard for uh, Office productivity documents. And because of that, I can freely switch between my desktop version of LibreOffice and Google Docs if I want to. And uh, by implementing open standards, we program for cloud freedom. Because there is always a way that you can take your data with you when you decide that your vendor is dominating or domineering. You can simply take your data and go somewhere else. Now, I'm also here to show you this. This is the same slides in LibreOffice Online. Um, LibreOffice Online is something that was uh, largely created by Calabra. They're presenting this afternoon. Michael Meeks is going to be presenting about this, I think. And uh, it's hosted by the Document Foundation. This is a full copy of LibreOffice that is designed to work in just the same way as Office 365 or as Google Docs. And it, too, uses ODF, and it does it perfectly because it's actually the same program as the desktop LibreOffice. But we've split the program into three parts. It uses a model view controller architecture, which you will have learned about in your computer science courses as something the way that people used to design software. And it turns out to be really good because, well, we have got the model, and the model works fine on every platform. It works on Android, it works on iOS, it works on Linux, it works on the desktop, it works in the cloud. And we've separated that out and built a different model and view, and we've built a, an HTML5 view that you can use here. And so we have dis we've architected the software so that it delivers freedom in the cloud. By creating software which is modular, we allow people to build new commercial proprietary software that uses our engine and thus allows them to work in our community while still working in a cloud world. And we also have this, which runs in a container, which if you had a hosting provider that was running this for you in a container and you didn't like them, you could just pick up the container and go somewhere else. So I encourage you to code for cloud freedom. 
Um, coding for cloud freedom means creating applications that use open standards so they can work in an interoperable or distributed way. Uh, interoperable has been the, the key phrase for a long time, but actually I suggest we focus more on the word distributed because distributed solutions are what works in the cloud. You don't want to consciously take the act of exporting your data and importing it somewhere else. You simply want to go to a new place and carry on using your data. And for that to work, the applications need to be interoperable. Not, does it need to be distributed, not just interoperable. And we suggest that you also build your solutions in this modular way so that you can build cloud versions. And preferably do both. Build solutions that are both distributed and decentralized and also are uh, solutions that can be built in a modular way for different platforms. Second thing, single project companies. If you remember the beginning of the open source revolution, the only thing people could talk about was open source business models. It was like, like, like the Bitcoin of its day, the only thing people could talk about even though it was actually based on a fiction because open source doesn't have business models. And well, Bitcoin, well, anyway. In the second decade, people were kind of tired of that and they started focusing on uh, making companies that controlled a single project and controlled the release of the project. And they made the con their control of the release of the project what was the scarce differentiating resource that they were able to sell. In the third decade, I think companies are going to differentiate by managing complexity. Uh, what I mean by that is um, people are going to build complex parts, into, uh, simple parts, into complex systems. They're going to build computer systems that do things that are unique and beautiful, like this cascade of butterflies here in California, that are made by putting together pre-existing parts rather than by trying to build it from, from the beginning. Uh, and uh, that is a skill that you need to be bring into your culture because uh, cultures of contribution are what let you build tomorrow's businesses. Yesterday's businesses were created by trying to get the smartest person and employ them. But today's businesses are created by getting smart people who know how to work with others. And so you should be creating cultures of contribution. You should be leveraging your intellectual property to create cultures of contribution, not to create uh, rent-seeking worlds of licensing. You should be using your, uh, your, uh, the results of your work to build up communities, putting your innovation in those other communities so that other people look after your innovation so you can innovate more. And you should re always remember that your contribution seeds the unexpected. Uh, open source has always been about, uh, it's, people use the term the freedom to fork, but that's actually a very important freedom. That's the freedom for an unexpected other person that you've never met to do a thing that is better than you could imagine or is even a thing that you couldn't imagine. And open source licensing creates the freedom for unknown others in the future to benefit from the code and improve the world. And so as you're creating a culture of contribution, remember not to keep your stuff to yourself and don't believe that your project is the thing that matters. Uh, you, could be, you could be right. Your project could be the thing that matters. We see lots of people trying to write licenses that prevent people from breaking the code apart and using parts of it elsewhere. But I want to come into your code and take that really clever salt routine that you've built and use it in my unrelated project. And open source licensing enables that. We're going to see license consolidation. Um, first decade, everyone wanted a license of their own. Uh, in the second decade, we discovered that, um, that licenses required compliance with reciprocal terms. In the third decade, I think there's going to be some other issues. Uh, the most important issue is going to be attribution. Because you're going to be assembling many small parts, you need to pay attention to the attribution requirements of the licenses. The MIT and BSD licenses require you to credit all the previous authors. And uh, if you don't know who they are, you can't do that. And so you need to be, make sure that you accumulate all of that rubbish and make something beautiful and useful with it. And you need to automate that. Make sure that you build it into the workflow for your developers. Make the build fail if the license is wrong. Uh, anything you put in the workflow will get done. Anything that you make a separate compliance re requirement outside the workflow will fail. So put it in the workflow. Put it into Jenkins. 
And we're going to rediscover software freedom. Software freedom is the, the key to what we've been doing with open source. But we have some new problems. We have the problem of c coins and cloud and containers. And they, they bring new issues that require solutions with a moral basis. So return to software freedom to find that. Don't try and create solutions that only solve your problems. Try and create solutions that have an ethical basis that solves everyone's problems. And I hope we're going to see OSI persist and continue. Uh, it's actually quite important that you support things like OSI. There's other things you could support. There's Free Software Foundation Europe. There's Software Freedom Conservancy. There are, there are other charities. There, there, there's a difference between things like the Linux Foundation and things like OSI. Linux Foundation is a consortium. It is a consortium of the commercial entities that rely on Linux. But OSI is a public charity. We are free, and in fact, we have a duty to speak up when open source has a problem. And so we need you to support us as well as OpenStack Foundation or as well as uh, Linux Foundation or whatever consortium it is that is crucial to your business. So that's the third decade lifestyle for you. Code for cloud freedom. Create cultures of contribution. Accumulate and automate to guarantee compliance. Cherish software freedom and apply it newly to your new newly found problems. And cultivate both charities and consortia. There's a lot of C's in that. Open source uh, is at the heart of the modern software industry. And software freedom is the essential core of what makes projects succeed today. Uh, open source is the same thing as free software. There is no difference between the two. There is only a difference between the two in the minds of people who want to create some division for some external reason. And the third decade of open source needs you to engage. Now, I, um, I'm, I'm, I'm getting on a bit. You know, I'm, I'm, there's a good chance that sometime in the next 30 years I might retire or die or both. And, and, and I, I know where all the bodies are buried in all these stories. I know why we did these things. I know why Sun picked the GPL for Java. I know who didn't want that to happen. Wouldn't you like to know those things? Well, mentor an old person. We often hear about old people mentoring the young. But you young people, mentor an old person. Help them to get comfortable and familiar with the modern world while you find out all the stories about why open source was made the way that it was. And then make sure you don't copy any of our mistakes. Copy our solutions instead, please. So with that, I'll wish you a very happy birthday to open source. I'll be doing that hopefully over a glass of champagne at the end of the day. And uh, I would like to thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you. Wow. Thank you for sharing the insights. Before you leave the stage, <laughs> I am sure that the um, audience will have one or two questions. And we do still have about 10 minutes time that we can use before I release everyone to the coffee break and release them into um, the sessions especially. Um, I'll change to German quickly, a bit yep. of mumbo jumbo. Also, falls ähm, Sie das jetzt nicht ganz alles verstanden haben, wir haben sonst auch in, unserem, äh, in unserer Broschüre ein Interview, ein Vorab-Interview mit Simon Phipps gemacht in den letzten paar Wochen, wo wir sehr ausführlich auch diese ganzen Basics ähm, mit ihm besprechen und äh, ein bisschen die Entwicklung der Zukunft von Open Source. Das ist in der Kurzversion, in der Broschüre, in der Langversion auch online. Ähm, da hat es noch ein paar mehr Fragen und Antworten. Also falls Sie jetzt hier etwas nicht verstanden haben oder etwas zu um, zu britisch Englisch war für Sie, dann uh, können Sie das da nachlesen. <laughs> so, all right, back to English. <laughs> yes, or British English. Or British English. Yeah. Um, first of all, uh, my, Matthias, do you have the microphone? Okay, good, because I would like to actually open, first open to the audience before, if, if you don't have any questions, I have a couple of questions noted, but I think it's more important that our audience gets a chance, as long as you're here, um, to grill you. <laughs> ah, okay. Zach, straight in there. Hello, Simon. So that was great. Uh, but one thing you didn't cover was how do you see the, the legislative environment changing around open source? Because uh, as, I mean, things like GDPR, not directly related, but that's an example of something that's a massive gravity shift that affects all those companies in the space. So what do you see in the software licensing space? Okay, so, so I think we have a serious challenge in that space. 
Uh, so in the previous decade, in 2005, uh, because the, the, there were two new directives that came out in the European Parliament, there was the Copyright Directive came out in 2000, and there was an attempt to produce a software patent directive in 2005 that, was, that failed. The reason it failed is because the free software movement mobilized. And we, said, um, we, we universally said, this is a very bad idea, you should not do this. Now, that, it didn't actually fail because we mobilized. It failed because we found the flaw. There was a crucial flaw in the, in the software patent directive, which was um, there was a clause that allowed an exception from patent rights in, for it to support interoperability. And uh, so that was why it failed. So, and I'll come back to that. So now, 10 years on, we're in a world where all the people that we talked to, all the lobbying we did, all the research assistants that we educated, they've all moved on. And the new generation of research assistants and politicians have all been briefed by Ericsson and Philips and by uh, other companies. And they all believe that um, the media industry is the most important thing. And they all believe that the software industry depends on keeping secrets. And no one has told them that the computer industry today runs on collaboration. And so they pay no attention to collaboration as they legislate. They have created GDPR, which is a disaster for small business and, and for small innovators. They're in the process of creating a new copyright directive, which is a complete disaster for free software uh, because of Articles 3, 11, and 13. And we have a crisis coming, and we really need to get you involved in this process, because what you need to do is educate your politicians. Um, they, you know, they, they do a fantastic job. There's, I've never yet, apart from people from UKIP, I've never met people who are there for bad reasons. <laughs> um, they, they are all there genuinely wanting to serve society. But the job of a politician is to summarize. Mm -hmm. a, a politician is not there to be an expert on anything. They're there to be a summarizer who, who takes all the input, weighs it up, and makes a decision that represents their constituents. And if you don't talk to them, they don't know. So you have to talk to them. You have to go and explain software freedom to them. And it's desperately urgent in Europe that, some, that people go do that. Uh, they go, go to the European Union. Now, you know, I don't know what the implications are of, of, of Swiss citizens going to the European Parliament. But as, we, as, we, as I've been explaining about to people in Britain about Brexit, just because you're not part of the European Union, it doesn't mean that its rules don't apply to you. Uh. We do actually have um, the EU policy director from Mickey, Wikimedia here today, who usually is based in Brussels, and he's trying his hardest to explain. <laughs> <laughs> I know that much. Any more questions from the audience? Doesn't see you do? Okay. May I? Do. May I just want a little question? Okay. Um, you have seen um, last week Microsoft announcing this patent yep. donation. How, how do you feel about it? Is it sincere or is there a hidden agenda? Well, I'm very pleased about it, honestly. Um, uh, you know, my, 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 my tiny, tiny claim to fame here is I've been, I've been uh, beating them with OIN for nearly six years. Uh, and so I used to write a column for InfoWorld, and I've written at least two columns for InfoWorld that call them, very politely call them bad things and tell them that they can only ever be redeemed by joining OIN. And, and so I'm quite pleased about it. It's very symbolic, um, uh, but uh, I, I did actually advise a, a Microsoft executive quite recently. I said, if you want to prove that you're into open source, lay down the patent weapons. You know, join, join license on transfer network, join OIN, uh, uh, make some commits in key patent areas into Linux, into the Linux kernel. And th uh, the, the, the license on transfer network is an anti-troll uh, um, uh, commitment. So uh, what it says is that if you ever transfer your patents to another company, you automatically grant a license to them, to every, all, all the members of the network. And it means that you can't take your, you know, your ex-fat patent and transfer it to intellectual ventures so that they can pursue people. Because the, at the point where you take your patent and transfer it to somebody else, everyone gets a license. And so anyone who's signed up to license on transfer network can't do third-party proxy patent attacks because their patents lose their power if they ever leave the owner. 
Um, so those two together, license on transfer network is a powerful anti-troll tool, and then uh, open invention network creates a, a, a mutual uh, annihilation relationship between all the members of OIN, which are now about 2,000 companies, including the very biggest patent holders. So if you've gone into that world and made a truce, you, you don't want to break the truce. So I think it's a thoroughly good thing. Ultimately, as I said right at the beginning, Microsoft's uh, behavior is, proven by, is, is the proof of their commitment. Uh, and there is a big risk that their legacy businesses will do things that are toxic. So I'm not resting yet, but I am extremely hopeful. They've got the right people. They have people who believe the right things and they're taking the right actions. And their business model is one that makes it in their business interests to behave well. So I'm, I'm very hopeful indeed about it. Maybe last question. Um, so you talked about the culture of contribution, and now you're also talking about Microsoft, big IT companies um, contributing to this culture of contribution. Do you see any hope for Apple? <laughs> <laughs> but you know, uh, so I said right at the beginning that the, 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 the free and open source software movement is, has got tr two roots. It's got the, the, the BSD root in Bill Joy, and it's got the, the, the GNU root in mm -hmm. Richard Stallman. And Apple is very squarely in Bill Joy's world, mm -hmm. where they, they believe that the... If I was going to summarize the BSD license, it says, here's my great stuff. Do what you like with it. Just don't bother me. Mm -hmm. okay. And uh, Apple is in that world. And it's deep in their culture. It was deep in Sun's culture as well. Sun was a BSD company and really didn't want other people to mess with it. And Apple doesn't want people to mess with it. Um, I think there is hope for them because I think that they will inevitably move towards businesses that live in this cloud desktop world. Uh, I think they are the ones who are going to be profoundly challenged by the cloud desktop. Uh, because, you know, in, I, I predict that by the end of the decade, everybody is going to be doing almost everything on a, a canvas which is populated from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And Apple is not ready to differentiate in that world, and they're going to have to reinvent themselves. And when that happens, they already use open source software everywhere. You know, the, the whole of, um, the, of Mac OS, right up to the point where the user interface starts, is all open source software. And they could easily pivot into being a major open source contributor. They just have to choose to do it. Mm -hmm. And it isn't in their genes, really, honestly, because they grew, up in, they grew up from the BSD side of the world where you, you do your stuff and I do my stuff and we don't mess with each other. Mm. All right. Well, if that was all the questions, then um, thank you very much for your time, for flying in. I want to um, give you a little speaker's gift for your tea. Thank <laughs> you. The Swiss quality oh, you th thermos You think I drink flask. tea? How oh, sweet. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, but it's got our nice logo on it's it. A, so. It's a very nice <laughs> bottle. And it's a <laughs> birthday present, I guess, for the past 20 years. And Absolutely. I hope that um, you can continue the fight or the... The, um, yeah, the engagement for the, engagement the next twenty years, and we'll um, yeah open the bottle of champagne afterwards at yes. at five. If at I'm, five, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>